To this point in our course, we've spent the bulk of our effort examining the available sources for reconstructing the life of Jesus, including the canonical Gospels, other writings of the New Testament, Gospels that did not make it into the New Testament, and pagan and Jewish sources from within the first century of Jesus' death. I should stress that the sources we've examined are the only sources available. If someone says something about Jesus that's not based in any of these sources, then they're making it up. We now need to move beyond a discussion of the surviving sources to the question of methodology. Given the nature of our sources, how can we use them to determine what actually happened during the life of Jesus? We should begin in the broadest terms by asking what a historian of antiquity might hope for in a set of sources and then reflect on how what we have available to us stacks up against this historian's wish list. Historians can, of course, imagine an ideal set of sources for reconstructing a past event. The sources would first be numerous so that they can be compared to one another. The more sources you'd have, the better. Second, the sources would derive from a time near the event itself so as to be less likely to have been based on hearsay or legend. Third, the sources would have been produced independently of one another so that their authors were not in collusion. Fourth, sources would not contradict one another so that one or more of them was not necessarily in error. Fifth, the sources would be internally consistent so that they'd show a basic concern for reliability. Sixth, the sources would not be biased toward the subject matter so that they would not have skewed their accounts to serve their own purposes. If a historian could reconstruct uh, sources for any past event, they, and if they could they'd have a wish list of these sources, this would be the kinds of sources that they would have. How do our sources for the historical Jesus match up against this wish list? To some extent, we're quite fortunate to have the kinds of sources we do for the historical Jesus. Jesus' life is presented in multiple ancient sources. For example, Mark, Q, M, L, Paul, Thomas, Josephus, etc. We have numerous sources that present us with information about Jesus that are ancient. Moreover, many of these accounts of his words and deeds are independent of one another. By which I mean, Mark did not know Q, probably. John probably had not read the synoptic Gospels of Matthew, Mark, and Luke. Paul, who was writing before any of the Gospels had been written, obviously didn't know what they were going to say, just as they show no evidence of having read Paul, and so on. So we have numerous ancient sources that are independent of one another, and that's all to the good. On the other hand, there are obvious historical problems with these sources as sources when compared with our historian's wish list. These surviving sources, for the most part, are not disinterested accounts by impartial observers, written near the time of the events they narrated. But they are, for the most part, provided by Jesus' own followers, who had a vested interest in what they had to say about him, and who were writing a long time afterwards, 35 to 65 years, uh, the dates separating Jesus' death and our earliest accounts of his life. Moreover, none of these authors was an eyewitness. They spoke a different language from the eyewitnesses. They lived in different countries from the eyewitnesses. They addressed different audiences with different needs and concerns. I should point out that even if these authors had been eyewitnesses, we would still have to examine their testimony carefully, for the beliefs of these authors and the needs of their audiences affected the way they told their stories about Jesus. So even if they were eyewitnesses, we'd have to look at them carefully, but as it turns out, these authors apparently were not eyewitnesses. Each of these authors, as two of them, Luke and John, actually tell us, 
inherited as stories from earlier written sources. Each of these sources had its own perspectives as well. In other words, when, uh, when Luke wrote his gospel, he begins by saying that he had many who, were, uh, who had written account uh, ahead of him that he had seen, and he was trying to write a better account. He had seen written reports, probably Mark and probably Q, and then something we're calling L, whatever L consisted of. So these, the point is that these authors of the Gospels have written accounts before them. The authors of the Gospels have their perspective, but each of the written accounts they're using had their own perspectives as well about Jesus. Even before anybody had bothered to write down any of the stories about Jesus, they had been in circulation by word of mouth for years and years. And as we've seen, they were changed, the stories were changed, in order to suit the purposes at hand. They were modified yet further when they were written down in such lost documents as Q, and further still when rewritten by the authors of our Gospels. It's important for us to recall that this view is not based simply on scholarly imagination, that the stories have been changed in the process of retelling and that the authors of the Gospels have changed them. This isn't just based on scholarly imagination. We have evidence from it, for it from the Gospels themselves, as we've seen in our earlier lectures. How then can faith documents, such as the Gospels, writings produced by believers, for believers, to produce belief, be used as historical sources? That's what we're going to begin talking about in this lecture. Before elaborating on some of the specific criteria that scholars have devised for using these sources, we should consider a few very basic methodological principles that most historians would agree should be applied to our sources. First, historical sources that are closest to an event have a greater likelihood of being accurate than those at a further remove. Sources closest to the event that they narrate are more likely to be accurate than those at a further remove. This isn't a hard and fast rule, of course. Sometimes later sources can recount events more accurately than earlier ones. But the rule of thumb, particularly when dealing with the ancient world, where authors didn't have our own data retrieval systems, is that the earlier is the better. The logic of the principle, especially when dealing with ancient sources, is that an event as an event gets discussed and reports about it circulate, there are greater and greater opportunities for it to be changed until just about everyone gets it wrong. The less time that has elapsed in the transmission process, the less time there is for alteration and exaggeration. In terms of our own study, this means that the earliest sources should be especially valued. Of our four New Testament Gospels, John is the latest, written probably about 60 or 70 years after the events it narrates. On the whole, it's less likely to be accurate than Mark, written some 30 years earlier. See, that's applying this rule of thumb. Mark's earlier. It's All things being equal, it's more likely to give authentic information, uh, historically authentic information, than John. Uh, and you should recall what John did with the date of Jesus' death. Remember, John and Mark differ on the day that Jesus will. John is writing later, and so it's likely that it's the one that's changed the date. So, too, with the Gospels of Peter and Thomas, which, while relying on earlier materials, were themselves evidently produced in the early 2nd century. They're later, they're less likely to be uh, historically accurate than, say, Mark or Q. Following this principle, this rule of thumb, our best source of all for the historical Jesus would be Paul, who's our earliest Christian author. Unfortunately, he doesn't tell us very much. Then he would be followed by Q, that is the common source that was shared by Matthew and Luke for stories not found in Mark, especially involving sayings of Jesus. Q would be followed by Mark then, be followed by M, Matthew's special source, which would be followed by L, Luke's special source, and so on and so on. Earlier, the better. A second rule of thumb is that we should be alert to later developments in the tradition that have affected our sources, especially in uh, our case, 
we should be alert to later developments that involve theological views about Jesus that developed after his death. We've seen, for example, that the Gospel of John, the last of our canonical Gospels to be written, has a far more exalted view of Jesus. Uh, it portrays Jesus as himself being divine, a far more exalted view of Jesus than can be found in our earlier sources. Our question as historians is not whether the things Jesus says of himself in John are true. The question is whether the things that Jesus says of himself in John are the things that the historical Jesus himself actually said. That is to say, in theory, Jesus could be divine, as John indicates, even if he never said so. But that's a question for a theologian. The historian simply wants to know what Jesus actually said. The logic behind the need to be alert to later theological developments is pretty straightforward. A greater passage of time has allowed a greater sustained theological reflection. And so books like John and Thomas, which may indeed preserve important historical information on occasion, are not as valuable to the historian as sources, uh, as books that uh, don't promote such a distinctive theological agenda. The third rule of thumb is closely related to the preceding two. We should beware of the bias found in each individual author. We should beware of the bias found in each individual author. We've already seen, with some of the sources we've examined, how just about every story in the account drives home, either subtly or obviously, the same point. For example, the Gospel of Peter appears to have a vendetta against the Jewish people, which colors just about every episode in the account. Whenever we can determine an author's biases, we must take them into account when considering his report. Uh, for example, statements supporting his bias uh, then have to be considered carefully as possibly deriving from him rather than from his tradition. And so statements supporting a particular bias of a particular author uh, should be taken with a, a, a pound of salt. You shouldn't necessarily discard them, but you have to look at them extremely closely. An example, then, would be the report in the Gospel of Peter that it was the Jewish King Herod and his Jewish court that had Jesus crucified. Well, in all of our other early sources, it's the Roman governor Pilate who said to be responsible. Peter's established bias against the Jews should give one pause when evaluating his version of the event in which it's the Jewish leaders that have Jesus, uh, have Jesus crucified. Or, as a second example, remember again the change in the time of Jesus' death in the Gospel of John, where Jesus is made to die on the same day, at the same hour, as the Passover lambs in the temple. But for John, Jesus is the Passover lamb, uh, as he himself says in chapter 1, Behold the Lamb of God that takes away the sins of the world. We should therefore be a bit wary of his dating of Jesus' death in view of his theological agenda. These, then, are our rules of thumb. Generally, we should prefer traditions that are early, that are not theologically developed, and that do not represent the bias of the author in which the tradition is found. Three basic rules of thumb that you can use with every tradition, probably of every historical figure that you're trying to, uh, to, trying to establish from antiquity. In addition to these basic rules, there are several specific methodological criteria that scholars have developed to help them reconstruct what Jesus himself actually said and did. These criteria have been developed over the course of the past, uh, past half century. 
by scholars who have worked intimately and thoroughly with all of our surviving sources. When you read books about the historical Jesus, a number of books, as I indicated earlier, will not even bother to tell you what their criteria are for determining what Jesus said or did. They'll simply tell you what Jesus said or did, not show you why they think so. Well, that doesn't strike me as a particularly useful approach. Other books, though, will talk about methods that are being used, and the scholars who do explain what the methods are that they follow will enumerate them and describe them. Sometimes they'll enumerate them differently from the three I'm going to give you here. In my judgment, though, everybody who does this follows these three criteria. You can enumerate them differently. Sometimes people will tell you there are five criteria or there are 12 criteria. You look at them closely. In fact, there are three criteria. Uh, and sometimes they're called different things. But basically, these are the three that just about everybody works with, uh, whether they tell you they're working with them or not. Uh, the three criteria can be applied to any tradition about Jesus that can be found in any source whatsoever whether uh, a later source, such as the Talmud, an earlier source, such as Josephus, Christian source, Jewish source, it doesn't matter. These three criteria can be applied to any tradition found in any source. My own reconstruction of what Jesus said and did, uh, that will you know, I'll go into in later lectures, I'll actually lay out what I think Jesus said and did, will be based on my application of these three criteria. And so you'll be able to evaluate at any point whether you think I've accepted the correct traditions or not. I should emphasize that if you don't like these criteria, uh, well, then, I mean, you just need to come up with your own. Um, what's not possible to do is simply to pretend that you don't need historical criteria. It's not possible simply to start quoting verses that you happen to like and say, well, Jesus did this, Jesus did that, because of the problems we've seen in our sources. We can't simply accept them uncritically as being historically accurate. That means then, if you, if you can't accept them uncritically, it means you have to approach them critically, which means you have to have some criteria. So if you don't, you know, if you don't like these criteria, there, there are problems with these criteria that I'll, I'll point out to you. They are problematic, but so far as I know, they're the only things we've got. Uh, and they do, in fact, seem to work when you apply them to the material. I don't think it's necessary simply to throw up our hands in frustration and say, well, we just can't know anything. Well, in fact, I think we can know things about Jesus. He's better attested than almost anybody else from the ancient world. So if we think it's possible to do history at all, we can probably do history of Jesus, but we have to do so critically using criteria and not pretend that we can get by without having some kind of method. In the remainder of this lecture, I'm going to be considering one of the three criteria. Uh, in the next lecture, I'll talk about the other two criteria. For each of them, I'll be trying to explain what the requisite logic of the criteria uh, is, and I'll try to illustrate the use of the criterion by citing a number of examples. And so the one criterion I'm going to talk about now is one of the most widely utilized by scholars who uh, work in this area of the historical Jesus. It's called the criterion of independent attestation or sometimes called the criterion of multiple attestation. As with the other criteria, one of the best ways to think about this criterion of independent attestation is to realize that the work of the historian is comparable in uh, many ways to the work of a prosecuting attorney. That is, as someone who's trying to establish what actually happened in the past. In any court trial, it's better to have a number of witnesses who can provide consistent testimony than to have only one, especially if the witnesses can be shown not to have conferred with one another in order to get their story straight. So too with history. An event mentioned in several independent documents is more likely to be historical than, e than an event mentioned in only one. This strikes me as a fairly commonsensical criterion. I'm not trying to deny that individual documents can provide reliable historical information. Of course, they can. Sometimes you have only one source and it happens to be right. But without corroborating evidence, it's often impossible to know whether an individual source has made up an account 
or perhaps provide a skewed version of it. As we've seen, we do in fact have a number of independent sources for the life of Jesus. Mark, Paul, Q, M, L, John, all wrote independently of one another. Moreover, the Gospel of Thomas, possibly the Gospel of Peter, and certainly Josephus, were all produced independently of our other surviving accounts. This means that if there's a tradition about Jesus that's preserved in more than one of these documents, since they're all independent of one another, no one of them could have made it up. Because if one of them made it up, you couldn't explain why someone else would have it independently. They both must go back to some other source if they both have the same tradition, since they're independent of one another. Moreover, if a tradition is found in several of these sources, then the likelihood of its going back to the very beginning of the tradition from which they all ultimately derive, that is, back to the historical Jesus, is significantly improved. I should emphasize that this criterion does not work for sources that are not independent of one another. For example, we have stories that are found in Matthew, Mark, and Luke found in all three Gospels. Just take one random example. Uh, the uh, story, uh, the so-called story of the rich young man. A man comes up to Jesus. He asks him, what must I do to have eternal life? Uh, Jesus says, keep the commandments. The man says, which ones? He says, well, do not kill, do not commit adultery, don't do this, don't do that. Uh, and he says, well, I've done all these since I was a youth. And Jesus says, then sell all your possessions, give your money to the poor, and come follow me. You'll have riches in heaven. And the man walks away downcast because he's very rich and uh, doesn't want to do that. Uh, it's a very, very interesting story. It's found in Matthew, Mark, and Luke. It's not, though, independently attested, because since Matthew and Luke got the story from Mark, it's found in only one independent source, not in three. I'm not saying that this story didn't happen. I'm saying that if the story happened, you can't show it happened using the criterion of independent attestation because it's not independently attested. See what I mean? What this means is that the criterion of independent attestation does not work for stories that are found among all three synoptic Gospels, since those go back to Mark, or among any two of the Gospels, since stories found in any two Gospels of Matthew, Mark, and Luke are either drawn from Mark or they're drawn from Q. Uh, for example, the Lord's Prayer. Well, it's found in both Matthew and Luke. So is it independent? No, it's not independently attested because that means it, it, they got it from Q. Okay. The best way to explain this criterion is to give some examples. Uh, I'm going to give you some uh, just some isolated examples of where it works, where this criterion I think works really well. Uh, these I'm calling them random examples. Then in fact they're they're pretty important <laughs> examples, but they're nowhere near a complete listing. It's just enough to show you how the criterion works. And so I'm going to give uh, looks at five examples of how you can apply this criterion to to important traditions. First. There are stories in which John the Baptist encounters Jesus at the beginning of Jesus' ministry that are found independently attested. It happens in Mark, where Jesus shows up to be baptized by, uh, by John the Baptist at the very beginning of his ministry. Matthew and Luke have this story found in Mark, so, but Mark has it. But also, Matthew and Luke have sayings of John the Baptist about the coming end of the age that uh, occur at the very beginning of their Gospels that they didn't get from Mark, so they got it from Q. Moreover, you have an account of Jesus and John having an uh, encounter with one another in the Gospel of John, which didn't use Mark or Q. So you've got this tradition in three independent sources, that Jesus began his ministry by associating with John the Baptist. Why would you have that same tradition in three independent sources? Well, they must have all three gotten it from somewhere else. It increases the likelihood that the tradition actually is authentic, that that's how Jesus began his ministry, by associating with John the Baptist, okay? just based on this one criterion. Second example, rather obvious one. 
Jesus is said to have been crucified. By all four of our canonical Gospels, plus the Gospel of Peter, which might be independent of the four, Paul certainly indicates that Jesus got crucified. Josephus, the Jewish historian, says he got crucified. Tacitus, the Roman historian, says they got cru- that he got uh, crucified. In all of these accounts, except for Paul's, the execution of Jesus is dated to the governorship of Pontius Pilate, when Tiberius was the emperor. Well, we know that Pontius Pilate was the governor of Judea from the years 26 to 36 A.D. We know this from Josephus. Given the widespread independent attestation involved here, Jesus was crucified under Pontius Pilate sometime between the years 26 and 36. Okay, independently attested. Third example. Jesus is said to have brothers in the Gospel of Mark, 6.3, the Gospel of John, 7.3, in Paul's first letter to the Corinthians, 9.5. Moreover, Mark and Paul, Paul in Galatians chapter 1, verse 19, Mark and Paul and Josephus all identify one of Jesus' brothers as James. Conclusion? Well, Jesus probably did have brothers, and one of them was probably named James. Now, these might seem like little things. Well, you know, not, not earth-shattering, but you have to start somewhere, and so you just start looking at what's independently attesting. You start building something, and so we're, we're getting someplace. We know something about Jesus' family. He's got brothers, one named James. We know that he was uh, associated with John the Baptist. We know he was crucified. We, just, we start building up from here. Fourth example, it's multiply attested that Jesus caused a disturbance in the temple that angered the Jewish leaders that ultimately led to his death, and that he actually predicted the temple itself would be destroyed. We find this in Mark chapter 11, John chapter 2, Mark chapter 13, Gospel of Thomas uh, verse 71. Uh, These are independent sources. My conclusion, Jesus probably did go into the temple and cause a disturbance, and he probably did predict that it was going to be destroyed. Fifth example, Jesus tells parables in which he likens the kingdom of God to seeds. Tells parables about seeds in which he says it's like the kingdom of God. These kinds of parables occur in Mark, in Q, and in the Gospel of Thomas. Conclusion, Jesus probably told parables like that. There are obviously limitations to the criterion of independent attestation. I should point out, first of all, that merely because a tradition is found in only one source, it doesn't automatically get discounted as inaccurate. In other words, the the parable of the prodigal son and the Good Samaritan, as I pointed out, occur only in Luke. They're they're not independently attested. That doesn't mean that Jesus didn't tell these parables. It means that you can't show that he did using this criterion. That is to say, the criterion of Independent attestation shows which traditions are more likely to be authentic, but it does not necessarily show which ones are inauthentic. That's a pretty big difference. At the same time, multiply attested traditions are not necessarily authentic either. Instead, they're simply more likely to be authentic. That is to say, if a tradition is independently attested by two or more sources, at the very least, it must be the tradition must be older than all of the sources that record it. That's not the same thing as saying that it goes all the way back to Jesus. Okay? It provides some probability, but it doesn't obviously provide any kind of certainty. For that reason, our first criterion has to be supplemented with others, and we'll be considering the two other major criteria in our next lecture. In conclusion... Historians have long recognized that we need to apply rigorously reasoned criteria to our sources in order to establish what Jesus himself said and did. In basic terms, we should look to traditions that are early, not theologically developed, and not reflective of the bias of their authors. More specifically, we should give particularly high marks to traditions that are independently attested in multiple sources. Such traditions are not necessarily historically authentic, but they have greater claims to historicity than traditions found in only one source. Such traditions are particularly worthy of the historian's attention, and especially 
when such traditions, independently attested, pass our other two criteria, which we'll be considering then in our next lecture.